Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Maria Jaju and today I am painting this cute girl in a purple kimono in a Japanese garden and talking about backgrounds. Backgrounds are hard. I think every anime, fantasy, and otherwise character-based artist struggles with it. The successful ones I call illustrators, and I really want to be like them. They have these single pages that tell amazing stories, and their pictures really are worth a thousand words. When I just started drawing, and especially in mid-high school, I doodled many doodles daily, and I drew many cute girls in various poses and costumes. But none of them had stories or names or environments that they were really a part of. I actually just named all my JPEG files Chick with a number. Except that I eventually got to Chick99.jpg and I didn't know what to do. I think the reason I'm telling you this is because I really want to demonstrate how complicated and hard I've always found backgrounds to be. Nowadays, almost all of my pieces have some kind of a background in them but it took a mental shift to get to this point. So today I wanna to talk to you about three things. One, how to get over the struggle of having to have a background when you didn't really start the painting with one in mind. Two, why should you do backgrounds in the first place? And three, why you should be starting to add your color with the background and not with your character. I'm going to start with the how first because I think it'll help you see the why. To make truly compelling art, it has to be unique. Doodles of girls floating in space with their cute hair like I was doing all through high school are great, but they are practice for the real pieces that you'll be making. What makes our art unique is our experiences that feed into our work. In other words, draw upon inspiration from your own life and the results will astound you. Those of you who watched my previous painting called Art Fails in Perseverance know that I had a terrible time with the flowers in that one and had committed to having flowers in my next painting that actually looked good. Reasonable colors, three dimensions, looks identifiably like the flower it's supposed to be, the works. Once I had that in my head, I needed a girl who could hold the flower. I thought that I hadn't drawn a kimono in a while, so that went into the mix. And once I knew that it would be a kimono, I knew what pose I wanted. This pose is one of my favorite traditional Japanese poses from Kabuki theater. I think it is one of the most elegant poses that you could have in a kimono. It started out in Bunraku, which is the Japanese puppet theater, where three foot tall, fully articulated and gorgeously costumed dolls could be manipulated in synchronous movements by two to three men dressed in black on stage. The pose specifically is a girl, mostly turned away from the viewer, who looks over her shoulder back at the audience, bending her back for a sweeping line. You cannot bend human backs as well as doll backs, so the kabuki version is much more understated. Incidentally, the men dressed in black are the ones who gave rise to the myth that ninjas dressed in black. Ninjas did no such thing. They would stand out from the populace too much. As my reference here, I used a photo of me taken in 2005 in March on a Saturday in a Japanese garden near, near the Heian Jingu and the Kyoto Zoo. I tried finding it on Google Maps, but unfortunately it's been too long. I do remember that the garden was behind tall walls, so even though it was on my way to school from the train station, I had walked by it for eight months straight before I knew it was there. Kyoto is full of hidden gems. One such gem is the kimono day that the city sponsors three times a year. If you're wearing a kimono on one of these days, you get into all of the tourist destinations like temples and parks and castles for either free or half off, and you get free public transportation so that you could go to those places the whole day. Our school had gotten some professional ladies who came in, dressed us up, and set us loose on this city. There are many photos of me from that day in this pose. This is how the last piece of the puzzle fell into place. My favorite experience in a kimono was in such a Japanese garden. So I had to draw my character in a Japanese garden. You see now how I went from a simple, I want a girl to hold a flower to a full scene. 
this scene has hidden stories inside of it of who she is, how she got there, what's on her mind. You wouldn't know this full story unless I told you, but any viewer will know that there is a story and try to figure out one themselves. So this is how you get to a background. My advice on why you need one is so simple and a much shorter one to talk through, but it does consist of three parts. One, you need a background because it helps you tell the story. It makes your image so much more interesting than if you've filled the area around her with ambiguous color washes. Look at this painting here. Don't you appreciate it more now? Two, you need a background because it helps you practice paintings you don't normally paint. If you like drawing girls in kimonos, you probably don't have very many realistic looking trees under your belt. But drawing those things helps you grow as an artist and develop your skills. You can then apply that back to the things you like drawing the most. And thirdly, you need a background because by putting your character in an environment, you get a much more interesting color application on the characters themselves. That last one is my third piece of advice on backgrounds in general. Color them first. Lighting comes from environment and all the color that the character depends on is in that environment. If you color the background first, you'll know better what color she needs to be in order to feel like she's part of their world. Whether she's in a brightly lit garden like here, or in a blue cast light of ocean waves like my summer court painting, and especially the backlit fire and exploding city like my Cassandra piece, you'll have a much easier time fitting the character in if you know what you're fitting her into. White backgrounds have a downside that they don't accurately represent the contrast in a way that a finished background does. And holding all of that color info in your head just won't work as well as seeing the color info on the page in front of you. At least, I am this way. I'm sure that some very skilled artists out there can pull it off anyway, the same way that they can draw an entire character from scratch without doing any kind of skeletons or under sketches or any of that stuff. But I'm not one of them yet. You'll also notice in several paintings that when I do the background first and then I do the character, I often go back and adjust the background so that the character pops. In my summer court painting, I had darkened the entire lagoon that she's in so that the water animals pop. Here I darkened the reddish tree so that you can see her obi in her hands. And by the way, a small disclaimer, you don't necessarily need a landscape in the background. You need something that helps tell the story and improve visual interest. Alphonse Mucha did flower petals and swirly lines and paisley patterns. Landscapes just happen to be the easiest to start with. So here we are. Do backgrounds because they enrich your art. Do them first because it is easier than to do them second. And draw from your life experience because it helps you come up with unique, interesting stories to hide inside your work. My last little bit of trivia is the color Murasaki, the name of this painting. It is a Japanese word for that kind of purple. I finally found a purple that I truly love. This one is a combination of ultramarine blue and quinacridone violet. I think you should really try it out. Thank you for watching my video and I will see you next time.